Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Pavel. I work at Cyber Reason. I've been with the company for uh, almost 20 months now. And people say that I still got the passion and excitement. So uh, that tells a lot. I used to work at McAfee for five years before that. They have great products. Um, but I, I was looking for something that brings a, a much faster time to value. And I found a web vendor whom I cannot change. If I find a better one, you'll see me presenting for another one. But at the moment, <laughs> this is the one. OK. So I will simplify today's uh, session so that we can shrink it down to about 20 minutes of the actual attack simulation. As you know, attacks, they usually take months, uh, if not years, like we've seen with the soft cell operation uh, against uh, 10 uh, telco providers around the globe that took seven years, and we were able to uncover it thanks to the capability of the Cyber Reason tool. First, I'll set the scene. Prevention doesn't work. We need it. It will stop the known commodity malware, but it will never stop the zero days, those advanced attacks. It will never be 100% efficient. So if we accept this, 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 this part, then we understand that detection is a must. So we have to detect, no matter what happens with prevention. And who cares about an alert if you can't do anything about it? If you don't even have a context about what has happened, just knowing that this executable is malicious, does it help me in my malicious operation investigation? Well, actually, it doesn't. And it requires a lot more data to be gathered and analyzed in order for me to have a better uh, view of, of the malicious operation. So let's imagine we've been investing into all these big Chinese walls, and then we hired a guy who was able to find the loose brick. And this guy got in, and you get an infection. Well, with the today's uh, approach of preventing everything, we see the situation evolving like this. So after the guy gets into your environment, you are forced to generate any alerts. Or look at logs. What that means, you're, you're, you're working with a lot of false positives until you triage them and until you have confirmed they're the ones that I need to work on. And of course, there is that guy in the middle right there who is really hard to hire. If you work in leadership roles, where are you able to hire level three analysts in the last six months? Just anybody? No? None? Great. I mean, well, it's very sad, but it's great for technologies like ours because we resolve this exact problem of lack of time and resource and skills and the knowledge. Because you need these people to manually crunch through the data. And there is a lot of data to be crunched through. And once they get the answer, they need to tell someone or, or use another console or use another solution or use another MSP in order to remediate. That is the sales. Th this is the, the cy cyber, uh, cyber cycle. Okay? And the main parameter right there is time. So what we're working towards is reducing the mean time to detect and mean time to remediate. What if I told you that the alerting can be much higher fidelity? What if I told you the alert itself can be pre-triaged for you so that you, by looking at it, don't need to press even any buttons. You understand what's the scope, what are TTPs used, tools, techniques, and procedures against your organization, what are the connections, what are the, the I don't know, the privileges, and the rest. Everything in one little package, graphically available for you. And then you have a button in the same screen that executes the predefined package that was built automatically by the tool to execute on remediation steps. You already see how quickly we can reduce the time to detect and remediate. But there is a problem. We all want to get there. How do we get there? We know that we need to be there. The problem is that all of your devices, all of the controls that you've been investing in are shouting at you. They're generating a lot of events. Okay, and it becomes a hard task of paying some Splunk licenses or any other data lake type licenses and then data analytics in order to make sense out of it. Which of these zeros is the one that you need to focus on? Once you have an alert somewhere in your environment on a single machine, how do you get to understand the entire cyber kill chain? How do you then collect all of the possible IOCs to improve your prevention? Especially when the attack started 200 days ago. 
So all of us being compliant for, for example, I don't know, at least ISO 27001, how many days does it enforce you to keep the data for? It's less than that number. It's 183, right? Half a year, six months. So you won't even have the data at the time when you get the alert of when and how did the bad guy appear in your environment. Cyber Reason found a solution to this problem. The solution is to move away from a legacy flat data model from relational databases because this model doesn't work. You have to compare and relate line by line each of the tables of each and every element that is changing on your devices. So if I say there are 400 metrics that we need to capture, it means that there are 400 tables that I need to compare line by line by line. And then I multiply it by the number of machines in your environment. And that's only in one day. What happens if the attack lasted for three months, for a year, two years? This is impossible. So other vendors, they're forced to collect either less data or ask less questions. Because yes, you might dump all the data into that Splunk or curator, but then you have to make sense out of it. You have to do, you have to apply analytics skills in order to get value out of the data that you have collected. Cyber Reason developed a patented in-memory graph database that is capable of collecting a lot of metrics, everything we need to detect. And then it correlates them at a whopping speed of over 20 million queries a second. There is no CM solution on the market today that can boast at least 100 times lesser speed. So here we will start the attack simulation itself. We have three actors, an attacker who is trying to uh, get some information from a CEO of the organization. He made his reconnaissance on different uh, open source uh, uh, web applications like LinkedIn and Facebook. I can get any information about your colleagues whom you are reporting to and the rest pretty much for free on LinkedIn and as you know that, and I can, bring, I can build my phishing attack based on this knowledge. So the attacker did his reconnaissance. He found out that Robert is an executive assistant for Maria Ross, and he is executive assistant for another couple of CFOs maybe, the ones that I might be targeting, okay? So his goal is to fish him, send an email that Robert will click, okay? And that's what we're gonna do now, straight away. Here is Robert. We have Maria's machine here as well, All right? That's Maria Ross. We have Robert, he's on Windows 10. He has Cyber Reason installed. Cyber Reason is installed in detect only mode. The only prevention that I have applied in this environment is anti-ransomware because the last step of my attack is going to be to destroy any proof of my presence. So I will ransomware encrypt the machine because I know the maturity of this organization is low, they're more IT operations based, so they're gonna just reimage the machine by destroying everything that I did. And they won't even understand what I did, hopefully. I have my Kali Linux. Again, this tool can be downloaded by anybody. It's available, you don't need to pay for it. So the level of skills required in order to execute the steps that I'm gonna show you is very, very low. Very low, okay? And amount of investment is also negligible, to be honest. So Robert, he's browsing internet. I hope he is. Maybe he's trying to figure out what's that Cyber Reason agent doing on his laptop. It's not slow, but he's supposedly doing something. Sees an email. I have masqueraded it as a recruitment plan. It's a document that Robert will open, will look around. The document says that, hey, in order for you to see the contents, you have to click the button, enable the content. He enables editing. Uh, and then he is really tempted to enable the content, but let's assume he had a phishing training. So he's looking around the document for any suspicious things. He sees another tab, he sees all of his colleagues' names, they're legit, their roles, they're legit. And now he sees his name, Robert Edwards, right? That's Robert Edwards. And he's gonna be replaced by someone. He wants to know who the guy is, play some political games and maybe retain his position in the role. So what's he's gonna do? He's gonna click enable the content. That's all I need. 
I'm as an attacker, let's imagine I sent maybe five emails to different people and Robert is one of them. So I see a connection coming up. There is a payload scriptlet. So what I'm doing, there is a stager. The stager lives of the land. Stager doesn't introduce any new files. It utilizes regisvr32.exe, a part of operating system, in order to run the scriptlet object, which then downloads using bitsadmin.exe an XML file. Nothing to be detected by AV engine. Nothing to be detected by next gen AV. All of these processes are legitimate and are available on each and every machine in your environment. And I have a common and control session established because I utilize DGA. So there are two parts in my stager. One is the actual procedure of the execution of the RegisVR, but the first one is the DGA for me to find a way back into my Cal Linux box. Okay. So now I see the session. I'll connect it. Sessions minus one. And I'm connected to hopefully Robert's machine. So what I'm going to do now, I have prescripted all of my steps, so I don't need to type. And I will run a first stage of my attack. Okay. So as you can see, I'm starting my attack. I'm using a get UID command to get the username of the, of the guy. So I know it's a user. It's not an admin. It's not enough privileges for me. That's number one. Second, I'm running from msbuild.exe because I've executed the XML file with msbuild. If you have IPS configured correctly, you'll be able to detect me because msbuild should not create remote connections. Okay? Now I wanted to move away from this attack as soon as possible into something more legitimate that is known to create remote connections, which is Firefox. And you saw me browsing on that machine. So I'll inject myself into the parent process there. I will then uh, do a net view command to see who is available, okay, what are the machines, whether my final target machine is in the network segment. So I can continue my attack. I'm in the right place, I've got the right tools, now I need to gain the right privilege. So because I'm running as a user, in order for me to move laterally onto Maria's machine, I will have to dump the hashes from Robert's machine. In order to dump the hashes, I'll have to be at least on the system level. At the moment, I'm a user. I don't have enough privileges in order to execute the rest of my operation. So the next step that I'm going to do is privilege escalation. Privesc.rc. So this is the flakiest part of, uh, of this attack simulation. Okay? This is a new exploit that we have used. This is really cool. I recommend you, if you're doing anything in this area, and you're investigating on ways to hack Windows 10 up to date, this is the exploit that you can use in order to gain system privileges. What has happened on victim one machine? There is a print uh, spool service that I ran. So I created a job in tasks folder to run print spooler service. When it runs, it runs as a system. I have introduced a print config, unsigned and unverified DLL that allowed me to do that, and now I'm running as a system. Okay, and I have created the session two. Now I'm ready for the second stage of my attack. Let me go back to the slide deck and just uh, figure out what, what's done. So we did phishing, we did bypass via fileless malware because we used living of the land techniques. Defender was useless in this scenario. And I did privilege escalation. Now I need to dump the hashes, right? So the next step for me is dump the hashes before I move laterally. I would also like to do a couple of more things here at the stage two. and we'll go with it for you. So I'm adding the persistence, so I'm creating a user ghost, and you can see that after damping the hashes, I already have the hash of the ghost user, okay? And I'm creating an auto root. So now all of my common and control activities will look like they're coming from Robert. So when they try to find me, it's not going to be my common and control, by the looks of it, if you use only network type solutions, okay? All you will see is Robert attacking Maria, Robert leaking the data from her machine, Robert introducing ransomware on her machine. Okay? So I'm trying to stay low and slow so that CM playbook based solutions like SOAR platforms they won't be able to detect me. Okay? I've got my hashes and now I'm ready to move laterally. Pass the hash RC. 
So I'm using, uh, as you can see, some BPS exec. I'm using the hash from admin. Same payload. I'm using same TTP. I hope that it will start any minute now. Yes, okay. So I'm doing the same. So the reason I do it is to show you the grouping capability. So when we use same TTPs or tools, techniques, and procedures in your organization on a 500 machines, we as a vendor, we want to provide you with only one alert. But we'll talk about the scope, the TTPs used, and what are your possible remediation options. Simplify the life of analysts, upskill their capability, and shorten the lifetime of the malicious operation in your environment fully automatically. There was no configuration done on Cyber Reason End. This is automatic. And what I'm going to show you on the back end, you will see all of these things triggering in real time. And by the way, let me just refresh it. You, we already see plenty of alerts. This is our past the hash, okay, across two machines. The last one was a few seconds ago. Let me go back and finish my operation. So, I have successfully moved laterally. Let me go back to my slide deck. So I stole credentials, moved laterally. Now I'm on Maria's machine and I can do spying. Right? So uh, simple uh, thing, just go with help. I need to background the session, I suppose. Let's background it now. So sessions minus I3. Okay, I'm on a session now, and now help. Okay, so here are different options available to me straight away out of the box. I don't need to create any scripts. I can record the mic, I can see the cam, I can do many things, right? Let's imagine I did whatever I wanted to do on her machine. So I stole some data, I maybe watched her, I don't know, doing something. Whatever was the goal, okay? And now, what I said I'm going to do, I will introduce the fileless ransomware, something that you cannot stop by signature. So even anti-ransomware capabilities that work on signature will be useless because the ransomware will launch from PowerShell. PowerShell is a legitimate operating system process, right? So resource, stage three. And that will finalize my attack. Now, on Maria's machine, as you remember, I told you I have anti-ransomware set in suspend mode only. So you should not be encrypting my files, but rather stop and suspend the PID of the encryption process. So my files are safe, but the bad guy doesn't know that someone is after him. He sees that the process is working, the files are being encrypted, okay? Now we'll pivot this situation and we'll spend more time in the UI and I will show you what is available with Cyber Reason fully automatically by just deploying the agents, okay? So we've stole important stuff, we've sent the encryption and as it always happens, I disappeared, okay? So now back to the UI. So we should see more things appearing in the discovery dashboard here because we did a few additional steps after I showed you that. We see the ransomware itself, so you see the PowerShell was the root cause for the ransomware behavior on Maria's machine. We see a lot of infection and we see one single common and control based on Excel.exe, again, a legitimate process. Here at the bottom of the screen you will see that we don't actually give a lot of estate for malware because in our world, IOC-based detection is not effective, okay? and it can be fully automated. So if you have all the signatures, it's automated. If you don't have the signatures, then you have to worry about the signatures, not the actual prevention mechanism, right? Let's have a look what we were able to catch. As you can see, Cyber Reason provides with signature-based, zero-day, and fileless malware prevention capabilities. In this time, in this demonstration, we used only detection, right? And here you can see different detections. This is our MS build. And here already you will see the power of integrating EDR with prevention capability. I can investigate and pivot into the EDR part of the solution, where I will see all the details of the execution of the MS build itself. So now who was the user, which machine he ran on, what was the parent process, what was the actual malicious process, any children involved, 
and there was an injected interpreter then following from MS build. As you remember, I've injected my code into Firefox from it to uh, stay low and slow. Okay. You have an individual timeline for each and every process in Cyber Reason, no matter if it was malicious or not. And I'm going to show you that. Let's take this as an example. CSC.exe was part of the execution here. We have its timeline here as well. Okay. We have all the details, including the command lines that this executable ran with. Even though it's not malicious, we detect anything. And our correlation engine, which is called cross-machine correlation engine, is what is generating those alerts, the malops, which I'm going to show you now. This is just AV. Okay? This is very simple. This is fully automated. Just leave it for the solution to handle. But if you want, you can use AV alerts to dig deeper into the data around them. So use them as your leads in hunting and triage. And again, as you can see, some classification was already applied. It's not malicious. It will never be flagged. But you can search for these classifications. And I will do that right now. And I have already created my search, and I click Get Results. And please appreciate the speed. The entire solution is running on premise on this laptop right now. The only limitation, if you want air gapped, would be threat intel. Everything else is automated and built into the tool. So all the models and algorithms of malicious behavior that we use, that we teach our machine learning engine that becomes AI because it's plugged onto the in-memory graph database. Graph serves as a neural network. Once you couple neural network and unattended machine learning, what do you get at the end? Narrow AI. That's exactly what this product does, by definition. So here you will see all the processes that run a command line containing temp. Non-relevant to the malware, but rather the classification itself. Now we'll go back into the discovery board. We will look at different parts of the discovery board. Here you will see that we have a couple of bigger bubbles. Okay? So this is, again, showing the cross-machine correlation capability where the same technique is used. Let me zoom in a little bit. How about that? Where the same technique was used to establish common and control with both machines. I told you that, right? So the same stager. Now, instead of generating two, two standalone alerts, Cyber Reason understands that's the same TTP. We'll just add the context to the scope of that alert. Okay? And we can go and have a look at that alert. This is the malop. Malop is a graphical representation of the malicious operation. Well, short. Malop, malicious operation. Okay? It gives you the root cause of an attack, the scope of machines and users affected, malicious processes, network connections in and out. Each of these parts of the visual representation is a clickable element. Okay? The first thing an analyst would do would isolate machines in scope. So let's assume I've panicked and I want to cut off all the machines that took part in this attack. First thing. And I'm going to do that from right here. I click isolate. I can see that it grouped all the machines in scope. Even if there were 500, 5,000 machines, I could isolate them with one click, one single click. Isolate. That's it. Machines should not have any internet connection. So if we go back onto Robert. Dun, 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 bow. Okay. We don't need that one anymore. And we'll try to go to Cyber Reason. It will most likely fail. Come again? Yes. Victim 2. Let's test it with uh, ping. Okay. I, I, I haven't got any connection, okay? but I still have the connection from the UI to the sensor. And I have a secure channel open for me to continue my remediation steps to do the remediation, I don't know, establish a remote shell capability and the rest. I will unisolate the machines later once I'm done. So here also you will see the timeline of the execution. So you know when the process has started, what was the process, what were the assets, network connections, and the rest. And you can pivot around that situation. So you can see that Regis VR is a valid part of the operating system. Sign and verify, part of operating system. Why did we detect it? Because of the behavior, the model of behavior that it exhibited, no matter the signatures. IOCs are important, but what if I'm using polymorphic malware? What if each and every machine in your environment will have a unique signature of that executable? How are you going to detect it? 
Now let me go back and let me show you the Mallow Pinbox. Mallow Pinbox is like your, email, uh, like your email client. It places newest alerts at the top, but it has two timestamps. So all the my attacks started with So all the my attacks started with the stager and the common end control. You can see that it was created 1206, but the last activity was just nine minutes ago, right? So if I search it, sort it by last activity, you will see the stager before me doing something with Maria's machine, okay? So you will understand when it was used last, when it was used first, okay? So this is when it appeared first. Excel. This is the DGA that I use. So I use a script, a macro inside of a document that I've hidden. You won't be able even to find it. So I'll show you that I'm able to download this X XML if I need to, but you won't be able to find the macro embedded. I, there are ways to hide it and they're available since times of XML 4.0, Windows 95. Still there, Microsoft didn't fix it. Like this full service uh, task schedule of vulnerability as well. They can't fix it because it's a workflow. Like you saw this uh, exploit uh, uh, with the Google Maps. Uh, remember the guy with the cart who created the traffic uh, on one of the bridges? Remember that. So he used legitimate capabilities, legitimate functions, but he created a workflow, a process that could use them in a malicious context. So this is the same. Now cybersecurity is exactly this. It's not opportunistic anymore. It's very smart. You're always against a guy who, is, who wants to be smarter than you are. So you need someone to help you. And cyber reason, because we already taught the engine of these models and algorithms, no matter the IOCs, you already have a helping hand right there. Almost completely automating the process. But as rightly said by Grant in his previous, pre previous presentation, you need a human to look at it. We just make it really easy for human to make sense out of it, right? There is no way we can fully automate things and we should not rely on AI because Skynet days will come then, right? If we give generic AI the power to decide for us, this is gonna be, we're, we're gonna be done because we're not good to ourselves either, right? The machine will decide we're not good for ourselves and what it will do, it will eliminate us. So what can I do from this? So machine is isolated, you can see it's isolated. I can now go and respond. And here you can see the guided remediation options available for me. Again, guided, what that means. Excel is a sign and verified process. It's a part of productivity tool set. You should not be quarantining Excel. If you quarantine Excel, the guy won't be able to do any work. If you delete any registry keys associated with Excel, it will damage the installation and you will have to reinstall it again, causing additional cost to the business and removing the efficiency and effectiveness of the person that you're doing this for. Again, if it's an L1 analyst and he doesn't know what he's doing, we will not allow him to do the mistake. Once again, upskilling your existing analyst, which is very hard to get. I asked you, were you able to hire L3 analysts? It's impossible these days. They're so expensive now. So we want to try and automate most of their job. Remember the Excel running? It's right there, still there. I'm gonna kill it as a root cause. Click apply. Remediation action sent, the Excel is gone. Okay, no internet yet. But I'm gonna go, so show me the response history. So from this malop, I have remediated this, uh, this malop, okay? I will now go into the machines. Oh, better, I told you that I'm gonna show you that I can download the, uh, the actual XML file. So I'll investigate on the root cause. This, this is what places me in a syntax-free investigation window that doesn't require any scripting languages from our analyst. Again, upskilling them. So I have my Excel. Let me open it. Let me see the opened files. Let me download it then. Now, we don't store those files because that's against GDPR. It's an analyst who needs to decide whether he wants to download the file from your machine or not. We're a data processor in GDPR world, okay? Download the file. So I will be able to download the file only if the machine is online. This machine was online, I can download the file. The file is right there, but is, uh, it's encrypted, okay? So uh, if it's a malicious uh, executable, for example, so I don't do a mistake and I don't open it. But there is a password right there in the metadata and I can, uh, I can open it up. 
this is the password, caution, handle with care. Very simple, right? So this is his Excel. All I see is this. Now, what is the power of cross-machine correlation then? Is this. First of all, I'm able to visualize the entire sequence of all steps. Because the data is already pre-correlated, you don't need to perform any additional steps in order to get the picture. Okay, so I'll zoom that out a little bit. And you will see the entire attack. So Robert on, on Explorer, which means that he used the mouse to click and open the process, okay? It wasn't a service, auto startup or something like this. He clicked to open Firefox. He was browsing it. Again, we have different types of classification suspicions. We have process information, where it runs from. We can download the actual file if we need to. We have signatures, what's the product type, and the rest. So all of that metadata. It did some 533 file operations, so it probably wrote a lot of cookies on my machine, definitely. I, and I, we, we can tell that, you know, we can look at each and every one. Each of those elements is investigatable if you need to. Two minutes, great. Yeah, that's all I need this time. You can see him opening Outlook, then Excel, and then you see my stager, right? So you see the Regis VR. You see the two children, you see the bits admin. Remember what I did with bits admin? I downloaded XML file using this process. I have a command line that I use to download. This is my Kali Linux box IP address, remember, 108. And what I did then? I then executed it with MS Build. Look at the amount of suspicions and pieces of evidence available to me. Each of them can be used as a query already. Nothing to build. Before I wrap up, I'll show you the syntax free UI, okay? So up until now, there was, everything was fully automated. If I want to be proactive and I want to do something myself, let's imagine I want to find a phishing attack, something that is impossible to build in Splunk language. Impossible. No one was ever able to build it for me. I've asked about it for the last two years. It's impossible. So a phishing attack starts from an email client. In our case, it was standardized as an Outlook, okay? I can already get the results. Then there has to be an attachment probably, right? So there has to be a child process. I will apply product type filters there. All of these filters are available out of the box because we use them in our detection mechanism. Everything we use is already available for you. Nothing to prescript, nothing to create. It's already out of the box, okay? In phishing, it could be a PDF, a link to a browser, or a Microsoft Office document, like in our case. Now, for this to become phishing, there has to be something else going on. And that something else usually is a shell process, right? PowerShell. But in my case, it wasn't. Do you remember what was it? It was RegisVR. And RegisVR, what is it? It's a non-specific OS process. I click Apply, and I get results. This is my stager. This is my phishing attack. The last bit. 10 seconds left. I want to know the common and control IP address using the same query. I don't need to rebuild the query to do that. I just say, show me all remote address connections coming from this process. And this is my IP address. I can blacklist it in the environment. And then if I have an integration with SOAR or CM, I can send a BL command based on this detection. And fully closed defense lifecycle right there. That's it, this ends my um, attack simulation presentation for you today. I'm available uh, for any questions you might have at the uh, Cyber Reason desk just outside of the room. Thank you for your attention.